Friday Mailbag. Welcome to the show. Adam Azer and Jamie Eisenberg here. Happy Friday, everybody. Less than two weeks until the start of the season. I've got my oversized Odell Beckham jersey on. Jamie, I'm ready to rock and roll, man. I'm ready for football. I've got uh, Danny Cannell's uh, jersey hanging behind me in our office here. So, um, yeah, it's a, it's a giant show. No surprise it, with you on. Oh, yeah. It, you know, it is a giant show. We have important <laughs> questions to answer. You just spoke to a, uh, a Bears beat writer, Adam Johns. He gave you some interesting insight. Mm -hmm. So we'll talk about that. Uh, they got a great quote about Blake Jarwin from Jerry Jones, oh, yeah. who typically is not, you know, full of hyperbole, right? But no, he, ha he had some great things to say about Blake Jarwin. I want to know who's rising in the rankings. I, basically, we're preparing pe uh, people for a weekend of drafting. If you are drafting, we've got, well, I've got, I think, five draft tips. How many did you come up with, Jamie? Well, you told me to come up with five, which uh, I will make up on the run. I don't think I told you to come up with five. Did I? Let me pull I, up uh, uh, this little machine. Oh, here. four or five. Four or five. Let me pull up this machine here that says Adam Azer. Let's see. Yeah, I said four or five. Hello. Today we are going to do weekend draft tips. You sent me this at 830 as I'm leaving the house. I didn't have a lot of time to think about it. Can you come oh, up no, with I, like four or five tips time. for people as they enter their drafts? Yeah. Okay, so we've got like up to 10 draft tips for you. Can I give uh, one? Yeah. Um, draft at least two sophomore wide receivers. No, don't you son of a... <laughs> you don't steal other people's draft tips. That is draft tip number one. That is so mean. Uh, let, me, let me get like the trending players that are either moving up or moving down for you right now. Last week, we talked Damian Harris and Bryce Love. Uh, is, are there any other players right now that you want to spotlight? Don't, don't look at ADP. It's outdated. Yeah. These guys are higher or lower. Well, uh, I'll start with Bryce Love because there's a report from a guy that I trust. He works for The Athletic, uh, Ben Standick. He's played in some fantasy leagues with me before. He's uh, a seasoned fantasy player. Um, he says that it's not a lock that Bryce Love will be on the active roster every week if they only carry three running backs because they'll go with Peterson, they'll go with Gibson, and they'll go with J.D. McKissick over Bryce Love, which is a little bit of a surprise to read that. So – He's probably somebody that has to be trending down. Uh, one guy that I'm very excited about, I've said this time and time again, but the reports just continue to be glowing, is Joshua Kelly. Uh, you know, he's the guy that um, – I don't want to say that I'll plant my flag with him, but he's somebody that I'm going to have a lot of shares of. I already have a lot of shares of him, a lot of drafts coming up over the next two weeks. And anybody that asks me who's the sleeper guy that you are highly recommending, this is the one because I do think he's going to be the backup to Austin Eckler or the second guy to Austin Eckler. And he may not have the job over Justin Jackson. Now he will have the job over Justin Jackson by the end of the season. This is the guy that I want on all of my fantasy teams. So would you take Josh Kelly ahead of Bryce Love? I have been. Okay. Um, would you take Josh Kelly ahead of Chase Edmonds? See, so that's the, the interesting part of it. That's where you have to play the draft. So as the hype continues, maybe you have to take Josh Kelly ahead of Chase Edmonds. I haven't had to do that yet. So, you know, if it comes down to those are the only two running backs available, then I'll probably take Josh Kelly over Chase Edmonds. But, you know, if Chase Edmonds becomes the guy for the Arizona backfield, he's probably going to be better than Josh Kelly unless Austin Eckler gets hurt. So, uh, I guess, do you have any, anyone else, by the way? Anyone else you want to talk about before we move on? Um, in Rise terms of fall. guys that have risers fallers um yeah or, or you know what also like players that you find yourself drafting a lot yeah i think i'm gonna write this you know kind of like a my guys column um mm -hmm. next week and you know so it'll be you know a lot of will fuller uh marquise brown dj chark there's three tight ends so i had a, a a buddy last night i was at my my eight-year-old's baseball practice and he had a uh, salary cap draft on Thursday night. And he said, you know, who are, who are some guys that I should be looking at tight end wise if I miss? And there's three, I say all the time, you mentioned one Blake Jarwin, you know, I've talked about him a lot. Uh, Chris Herndon is the other one. And then Mike Gusecki. Those are three guys that if I don't get one of the tight ends that I like, and for me, there's eight, like I've dropped Gronk out of the top 12. Um, I'm not taking Austin Hooper. I'm not taking Jared Cook, you know, guys that are typically drafted as top 12 guys. I take one of those three almost every time. And if I can get two, I'll take two. Why not Noah Fant? In that group, for, uh, he's in he's in that group, yes. But I'm just saying, like for me, the three that I target are those three: Fanton, Hawkinson, and Johnu Smith are also in that group for sure, hundred percent. Those three guys, I think, all six of those guys, it wouldn't surprise me if three or four of them break out. They all could be terrible, because from what we saw a year ago, you know, Herndon not playing, Jarwin maybe is not 
even going to fill the Witten role. But I think you just see paths for all of them. You know, I think Fant benefits with KJ Hamler banged up. I think Hawkinson, uh, we had Dave Burkett of the, not the athletic, the Detroit Free Press, excuse me, on HQ this week. And he said, Hawkinson, despite the ankle injury, he said, he's like, that was a red flag for him. But he said, you know, you watch him play and he's looking great. Um, Mm -hmm. I moved him up in my rankings. Uh, All those guys are in that 10 to 15 range for me. And to be honest, I would take all of them over Gronk. Okay. And uh, this is what Jerry Jones said about Blake Jarwin. Certainly Jarwin is getting to spread his wings now, whether it's Coach McCarthy, the offensive staff, his teammates. He keeps showing up out there. He's just... He's really coming into his own, and nothing would surprise me with him in terms of what his production could be this year. He just keeps getting better. His rapport with Dak is outstanding, and I really think that he's got a chance to step right in there and be a really good, if not great, tight end for us. Jerry Jones on Blake and Jarwin. I'll give you one more real quick, uh, just because um, Pete Prisco was on HQ with us on Thursday and kind of recapping. I, and I highly recommend, if you can find the segment, you could you know just uh, check it out on, on demand for our HQ. Um, so... Pete usually goes to every, not every, he usually goes to about 15 or 16 different stops in training camp. And, and that's been changed because of the pandemic, but he's still, you know, on the phone with guys that he trusts and, and, and players, GMs, et cetera. It was just a great conversation and not about big name guys. One in particular was Ian Thomas. And he spoke to some people in, in Carolina and he said, same thing like what Jerry Jones just said. He just keeps making plays. And you look at this offense. And as Pete said, I think we can all agree bad defense going to be thrown a lot. We've heard, you know, uh, Ben and and Heath talk about the projections for Teddy Bridgewater and what the anticipation is of how much those guys are going to throw a lot of weapons in this offense. Some stand out like McCaffrey and more some guys that are just, you know, in that middling group of, of Anderson and Samuel, but Ian Thomas is somebody that they say has has sort of clicked a little bit over the last couple of weeks and and they're excited about him. So he's another guy. He's at the tail end of that group, but he's another guy in that conversation that if you take a second tight end, I'd look at him. Yeah, you know, we we did. A, I tried to do a segment yesterday called the trip down memory lane, where I looked at. I'm actually, I'm gonna get. I'm gonna get this up right now because I thought it was pretty funny. Um, I looked at some of the notes from last year's podcast notes and some of the reports that were coming out and things like that. Um, and one of them was about Curtis Samuel and how he was making so many plays and it's gonna happen in the regular season. Let me just give you the quote: "The Charlotte Observer. He makes one or two plays every day that brings a wow factor, and it's a safe bet the same continues once the regular season gets underway." That was the Charlotte Observer. Who would um, fall for that? Debo Samuel. <laughs> that was uh, or on Curtis Samuel. That was on like August fifteenth or sixteenth. And the thing is, like, he had one hundred and five targets and nineteen carries. He just had bad quarterback play, and like, and I know you were just talking about Ian Thomas, but I don't want to completely neglect Curtis Samuel here. Uh, they are probably going to throw a lot, and hopefully Teddy Bridgewater is a lot better than Kyle Allen. Uh, but if you if you, a guy gets 105 targets and 19 carries, he's probably going to be a top 30 wide receiver, I would say. You know, uh, yeah. I don't know. And, I don't know. Like obviously they have Robbie Anderson. I'm not saying we should expect the same thing, but right. I just think let's not forget how big of a role Curtis Samuel had last year. And his role is probably going to change a little bit because now Anderson is the deep threat. And so Samuel is going to run some different routes and they'll move him inside. They'll, they'll alternate with him and DJ Moore. That's one thing Pete was, was bringing up as well. Uh, just one more thing on Ian Thomas. You, you've heard me say this a couple of times. 80 targets is the number you need to be in the conversation for the top 12. There were 13 tight ends that had 80 targets. 11 of them finished. I'm sorry. Am I getting that right? 11 of the 13 best tight ends had at least 80 targets last year in PPR. Okay. The two that did not were Hunter Henry and Jared Cook. So 13 tight ends, I'm sorry, the top 13 tight ends, 11 had 80 targets. Now, again, you've brought this up and it's a great point. Do you want to be in the 11 to 13 range or do you want to be in the top eight, let's just say? But at least you get in the conversation, right? And that it's like you want to, uh, if you, I, I don't know if you've watched Hamilton yet, but you want to be in the room where it happens, right? So yeah, not. <laughs> if, you, if you want to be in the, at the party, Get to that 80 target number. Well, you know what? Who had 80 targets last year? Greg Olson. Oh, Greg Olson. Oh, Greg Olson had 80 targets last year. Witten is what I meant. But um, Jason Wynn had 80 targets last year. So Mm -hmm. if if he steps into an 80 target opportunity in terms of Ian Thomas for the investment that you make, the floor is there. The ceiling we don't know. Yeah. Okay. No, you're right. It's it's a great it's a great number to look at. 
Um, all right, so to recap, Bryce Love may be down. Look, you don't know. What, week one, he might not be active. And so we got that report. So Bryce Love may be stocked down a little bit. Still worth it a, has to. Like a flyer, right, though? Still. Yeah, so I, I'll give, that, that same buddy of mine, he, he, you know, I told him some of the guys to look for late in the salary cap, and he got Bryce Love and, and Josh Kelly. He also got James Conner, and so he sent me a picture of his roster this morning, and he said, should I drop anybody for Benny Snell, who's another guy getting some hype as clearly the second guy. He's, he's passed Anthony McFarlane if there was any concern. And I said, no, you just, just wait. You know, obviously, Conner's not getting hurt, hopefully, in the next two weeks. Um, to see what happens. And so then this report comes out and he texts me, he goes, should I drop Bryce Love yet? And no, don't drop, don't drop Bryce Love because Adrian Peterson is 35 and Antonio Gibson is still a work in progress, but they like JD McKissick apparently. And so uh, I think Bryce Love is somebody that you still take late, but maybe not in the, you know, 10 round nine to 10 range where I think he was starting to go. All right. Josh Kelly on the rise and Jamie's looking at Chris Hernan, Blake Jarwin, Mike Kosicki, as a group of tight ends, if he doesn't get one of his top eight to take a look at late in drafts and maybe draft two of them. There so you go. there's not- one of my five draft tips, draft two oh. tight ends. All right. You know what? I have a, I have a tight end draft tip as well, actually, Jamie, and um, very similar. I'm calling it greater late. And this is based on just all the drafts we've done and what I've found myself doing. And I really like Mark Andrews and I want to take him. I think I'm more likely to take him in a two-wide receiver league, but every league we play in now is three receivers and a flex. So I feel like when Mark Andrews is being taken round four or five, I'm really building out my wide receivers, my starters, and my depth at that point, rounds four and five. So I haven't been able to get them. So like Kittle, Kelsey in round two at some point, I'm all about that. I've been doing that. If I don't do that, it just seems like, not necessarily intentionally, it just happens this way. Uh, I'm, I'm getting, the guy I love to get is Hayden Hurst. Yep. And then if not Hayden Hurst, then we're talking Noah Fant, Blake Jarwin, that group, and maybe taking two of them. Yep. So for me, it's yep. been great or late. I haven't been messing around with the Evan Ingram, Hunter Henry, Darren Waller group. And it's not like I think they stink and they're busts. It's just I'm really worried about other positions at that point in the draft. Uh, I so couldn't I th- agree more, 100%. Like, it's, and I would throw Zach Ertz in, in the Andrews – and higher group, you know, it's essentially like if you get Ertz in round five, it's worth it, you know, depending on what your first four picks have been. But I'm, I'm with you. Like I'm not reaching for Waller. I'm not reaching for Ingram. I'm not reaching for Hunter Henry. I'm certainly not reaching for Tyler Higby. He terrifies me. You know, it's one of those, I have him ranked basically for fear of missing out more so than I do in terms of a confidence play. But I think, you know, it's hard to overlook what he did his last five games, you know. So if, if that guy shows up to any level, he's going to be a top 10 tight end. Uh, Gronk is the one that I just kind of decided I'm out on. So I put him behind those guys. But, yeah, I'm with you. I think it's just one of those scenarios of take two of them mm-hmm. and play it out. You know, I was, I was really – did you, you took Blake Jarn in our IDP draft, right? I took Travis Kelsey in the second round, and then this is such a deep draft. There's there's twenty right. there's 20 you, spots. You took or whatever. Jar- there's a ton of- I was going to take, him. right? And and I think I called you an expletive in in a yes. chat, um, because I was I was going to pair him with Evan Ingram, who I got at a good price. You know, so if you get one of those guys at a good price, yeah. take it. Well, well, so let's talk about that. Let's talk about what that good price is, because this really changes for me two receiver versus three receiver or like one flex versus two flex. If you have to start three receivers in a flex, or let's say it's two receivers, but you're playing with two flexes that that is where I think I'm, I'm in this greater late strategy where I'm, I'm probably out on the mid round tight ends. Um, But if, if I'm in a two receiver league, I guess like I'm really intrigued by Darren wall. I I guess I'm just more likely to go for the tight end in rounds four through eight or something like that. But like, do you have a range where, where did you take um, Evan Ingram yesterday, for example? It's such a hard draft to compare because the defensive guys are going, but I think I got him like round 10, you know, it was, it was something silly like that. So, you know, I I think the thing you got to gauge is for me, it's okay. When I get to the point of when I see it's like Jarvis Landry, Julian Edelman, um, I don't want to put Marvin Jones in that category, but you know those type of receivers that are the number three receivers. The ceiling may be a little bit capped. The floor is fine, but, you know, are you looking for a difference-making player? And then it's the quarterbacks, and in some cases when we get – this is usually in the round six range. Some cases you still have Watson, 
Wilson or Murray on the board. So I would lean that way. But when the quarterbacks are gone and that's the group of receivers and the running backs are in the uh, Marlon Mack, carry on Johnson, uh, you know, maybe still JK Dobbins, you know, those type of guys, uh, the dolphins guys. And I look at it and I say, okay, what's the best play for me at that point? Then is when I pull the trigger on uh, Ingram or Waller or Henry, if they're still there. All right, great stuff. That's that's when I buy into that group. What I would like to do is wait another round and get Hayden Hurst, personally. Okay, great. Um, Do you you want me to go or do you want you to go with another tip? Go ahead. You can go. All right. The strength of the fantasy draft appears to be the rounds three through five wide receivers. And you should keep that in mind with your first two picks. But I think in terms of where is is any position particularly the strongest – Rounds three through five wide receivers, there are probably a dozen of them who have a chance to be top 10. Some have a chance to be top five. Kenny Galladay, Allen Robinson, Mike Evans, Juju Smith-Schuster, Cooper Cup, Robert Woods, and then, you know, a little bit later, Lockett, Metcalf, McLaurin, Chark. You want to be in on that run, and that's why I don't really see why you shouldn't take at least one running back with one of your first two picks. Uh, So I think you, you basically... My drafts are dictated by the fact that I know I'm going to come away with oh, I didn't, Odell Beckham's in that group. But wide receivers I love in rounds three to five. Okay. It's amazing. It, yeah. it, it really is amazing. You know, and I think we're going to end up seeing um, guys like McLaurin, Sutton, Chark, mm-hmm. uh, Diggs for sure. You know, late round five and in some cases round six. And look, A.J. Green's practicing again. If you want to buy in on him. T.Y. Hilton, if you want to buy in on him, round six, I mean, that's probably where they're going to end up. Keenan Allen around five, you know, especially PPR. That's still not bad, especially with all the targets he's going to get. So I'll give you an example. We talked about this with the draft you did. I think it was our, our Snickers mock draft. I think you went Julio and Drake, right, at 12, mm-hmm. if I'm not mistaken. Yep. PPR. So I had a decision to make in the IDP draft. And so this, we can actually talk about the offense, guys. I had the 10th pick, and Devontae Adams was there. That's what I took. Ooh. But – I was, I was debating because Miles Sanders was still there. And I was like, you know, I don't have any shares of Devontae Adams yet because I've been going running back, running back. So I'm like, okay, uh, Sanders is still on the board. Drake's still on the board. Jacob's still on the board. Uh, Eckler, Chubb, all on the board. I said, I don't think I'm going to miss on one of those guys. So let me take Adams at 10 and see which running back comes back to me. It was Austin Eckler. Had I taken Sanders, and let's just say it fell the same way, Eckler or Chubb, because Chubb went after Eckler, taking those two guys. I took Calvin Ridley in round three. So let's – that he would have been my number one receiver. And then I took Jonathan Taylor in round four. Instead of taking Jonathan Taylor, I could have taken Cooper Cup or Robert Woods. Mm. I feel like I like that start better. Yeah. As much as I love Devontae Adams. Right. So, yeah, just keep that in mind. Those rounds three, four, five wide receivers are just – it's just loaded this year. Um, draft my, – my draft day tip number three. So, I've got so far greater late at tight end. Strength of draft appears to be the rounds of three to five wide receivers. Number three, draft at least two – Year two wide receivers. I'm a big believer in this. I, that <laughs> I wish, and Jamie, and year three wide receivers too, young wide receivers, but year two wide receivers, it's not hard to do. It starts with A.J. Brown, Terry McLaurin, D.K. Metcalf, Marquise Brown, Deontay Johnson. If you miss out on all of them, Darius Slayton, Debo Samuel, Paris Campbell. If you're in a super deep league, Miles Boykin's getting some hype. What is this based on? All right, just look at the last three years. Michael Thomas had a great rookie year. He was even better in his second year, 104 catches, over 1,200 yards. Tyreek Hill was wide receiver 22 in ADP, and he finished as wide receiver 9. He had almost 1,200 yards and seven touchdowns. Robbie Anderson was wide receiver 57 in ADP that year, and he finished as wide receiver 18. The next year, Juju Smith-Schuster was a mid-round pick. He was wide receiver 18 in ADP. He finished with 1,400 yards and seven touchdowns, wide receiver 8. Kenny Galladay, Chris Godwin, they were not top 50 picks in ADP. They both had really solid years. Uh, Galladay had over 1,000 yards. Michael Cooper Cup had a huge second year, but it got cut short, cut short with the ACL. And then obviously last year, DJ Moore, DJ Chark, Cortland Sutton, Michael Gallup, Calvin Ridley. These year two guys are breaking out. Try to get at least two of them. Uh, that's number right. three. And, oh. and, you know, yeah. I obviously – no, I was going to say, I, I talk a lot about the third-year receivers, but that's, it, it's a building process. 
you yeah. know, so when they, when they have these good second years, sometimes they have a better third year, but you know, you want to get in on it when it's on the rise, especially if you're talking about like some keeper league implications, you know, if you could get a guy with a mid round pick and then he blows up and you have him at that value going into year three, when hopefully he even gets a, a little bit better. Sure. Yeah. Year two and year three for wide receivers are big breakout years. I, I'm going to, I'm going to piggyback off that with something similar, but not about the second year wide receivers. And, and this is something we talk about a lot. Don't be afraid of, this is a tip. Don't be afraid of league winning guys if they have a bad track record, but the situation is good. And you know the guy I'm going to talk about, and that's Will Fuller. So uh, I didn't know who you were going to talk about. It's, it's not just him in particular, but it's guys that, you know, Marquise Brown, for example, uh, Deontay Johnson, for example. I know you mentioned those two guys in particular. But they have scenarios at play with them that you look at and say, can they be league winning type of guys? Will Fuller, obviously with the injury situation, Marquise Brown, are they going to throw enough? Is he big enough to be a number one type of guy? Uh, Deontay Johnson, is he the second guy? Is he the fourth guy? You know, Chase Claypool's having a, a good camp and, and James Washington's been there and Johnson's been in this, uh, in this, you know, uh, injury situation that he's been, you know, for, for a few days. Uh, Debo Samuel is, and, and when I say league winner, it doesn't have to be a top 10 guy, but somebody that you could end up like, like Robbie Anderson for, for example, what you said the 57th player off, off the board and was yeah, the top 18 player by the end of the season, right? It's, it's, it's those type of guys that you could just say, I'm starting them every week and I paid nothing for them. I, I got them at, at reasonable prices. Now, Will Fuller is not a reasonable price in round seven or eight, depending on how far he goes. But if he hits to the level that I think he could, and a lot of people think he could, he's going to be a top 10 wide receiver. So yeah, don't, so you know, else in this, is in this group, like Nicole Hardman, maybe. Right. Those, those guys need injuries. I'm just talking about guys that don't need injuries. But, yeah, I mean, uh, Chase Edmonds is, is a good one. Tony Pollard, uh, Alexander Madison. You know, you want these guys on your, on your roster. You've got to be patient in some cases with these, you know, running backs. But if they hit, they're, they're great. I, I'm, I'm, I was more looking at the guys that are, you know, uh, because the counter argument to that is, well, Will Fuller's always hurt. Deontay Johnson, what role is he going to play? You know, and, and maybe I'm playing off of comments from my colleagues. You know, Dave's not a Will Fuller guy because of the injury track record. He's not a Deontay Johnson guy because he sees a crowded receiving court. You know, those type of uh, counter arguments to these type of players. Yeah, right. It's all about, it's all about cost for sure. Okay, um, here's another tip from me. Round six for QBs, three through six. Feels like the <laughs> – remember what happened yesterday, by the way? How did you not comment on that with Kyler Murray? My comments that you wanted Kyler Murray. You didn't see those. That you that said I, you I said, okay. One pick, one I pick want away. to I, like about four picks before me, before I was up, I said to you, mm-hmm. I want to draft Kyler Murray so badly, like more than I've ever wanted to draft a player at a particular spot ever. <laughs> and then I said, one more pick all in caps. And then right before I went, Jake Seeley took Kyler I, Murray. I, I, yeah. I didn't see the lead up to it. I just saw the whole thing. So. Oh. It was hard to it was hard to get the gist of what you were doing. So I apologize. And I wrote, I literally can't even. Um, yeah. So I don't know how realistic it is. They they're going. It seems in round five, the Dak, Russell, Deshaun, Kyler group. But to me, like round five, fine. And maybe this is another like two receiver versus three receiver, two flex versus one flex thing. Um, I think Jamie, as you do more drafts, especially ones that count, you figure out the players that you really really like, and it's Kyler Murray for me. Mm-hmm. Uh, obsessed with him i might have to start taking him in round five i don't necessarily want to but i might have to but if i can get him in round six it's a no-brainer i don't even care what my team looks like uh it's a no-brainer that's the that's the range for we'll, uh, round six for those four quarterbacks so prisco spoke to some people out in arizona and they're just over the moon for him that he's first one in last one out put on some weight you know muscle and really connecting with Hopkins uh, in that same conversation. He, you know, Pete said they're, they're, they told him, you know, Hopkins is doing a good job, but don't expect 150 targets. Um, and then my last tip would be prepare for injuries. And I think this is, this is really pandemic related. Prepare for absences due to COVID, but also uh, what, we, what Vic Fangio said about all the soft tissue injuries that his team has had more in like eight days of this year's camp than all of training camp preseason uh, and like OTAs combined or whatever he said. But in baseball, pitchers have we settled are, on the amount of have we settled on the amount of IR spots that we should tell people? No, three, five. 
Well, the tricky thing for me is like, what, what's, who goes on the IR? Anyone who's injured or just COVID? Um, the way I've done my leagues is COVID related absences, because I think it's just such a weird situation that we're going to deal with for the first time and short term IR. So like, you know, don't, I'm not going to make somebody, if we're going to put an IR spot out there, you know, if somebody misses eight games, they can hold them. Yeah. And, okay. And, you know, keep, keeper leagues and whatnot, they can put IR guys on, on that spot. Yeah. I, I don't usually do with keeper leagues. Dynasty is different. I do think we might see more injuries this year uh, just because of the lack of preseason, the lack of contact. And it's a total guess. It's a total guess. But, you know, I'll give you, I'll give you the, the running back group I have from yesterday's draft, which keep in mind, there's really not much on waivers because it's such deep benches. I took Alvin Kamara in round one. I took Ronald Jones, I think, in round five. I took Cam I Akers. Off that one. Yeah, I did, actually, yes. Mm-hmm. I took Cam Akers. Then I took Daryl Henderson, Latavius Murray to back up Kamara, Alexander Madison as a long shot, and I think that's it. Um, so I have the Saints backfield. I have two of the Rams guys. I have Ronald Jones, and I have Alexander Madison, but... You know, I wanted to give myself a little Camara insurance, a little Rams insurance. So I'm sure. drafting backups, and I have Alexander Madison if the most injury-prone running back in the first round happens to get injured in this year, where I, which I think will have a lot of injuries. Um, yeah, no, so. I did the same thing by taking Darrington Evans. Um, I, I kind of have a little buyer's remorse on Bryce Love. Not that I took him high, but I you know, still drafted him. And I, I also handcuffed uh, Jonathan Taylor with Marlon Mack, you know, just in the standpoint of if, if Taylor's not getting the workload that I hope I can plug Mack in there, especially at the start of the season. So I think I've got six tips total then. Let's see if we're missing anything. We, we have our sort of shared tight end strategy. We're calling it greater late. Uh, and again, if you get a mid-round guy at the right spot, that's fine. You've got the round three to five wide receivers should kind of dictate your draft. Draft your two guys and your three wide receivers. That's three tips. Number four was don't be afraid of league winning guys with bad track records, but have good situations like a Will Fuller. Round six for QBs three through six, especially Kyler Murray. That was tip number five. The especially Kyler Murray was my thing. Uh, I don't want to speak for Jamie there. And prepare for injuries. That's my sixth tip. Um, anything else? I mean, I'll I just say something we've said for years is, you know, wait on quarterback. And you can find two of Ben Roethlisberger, who is getting rave reviews, Jared Goff, who should – play better than he did last year if you especially take out those four games against just amazing defenses and he pooped the bed um daniel jones matthew stafford who is the number three quarterback or top three quarterback in points per game before his injury there's just so many guys that are good uh you don't have to reach for a quarterback early so if you don't get one of the super six guys and mahomes and lamar jackson may go in round one in your league um, speaking of which, I have two father-son drafts this weekend. My eight-year-old is going into year four, and he <laughs> wants to take Lamar Jackson in round two. And my five-year-old is doing it for the first time, and he wants to take Patrick Mahomes in round one. <laughs> so it's going to be a, f- a fun conversation as I teach them the ways of the fantasy world. But uh, you can get great quarterback play late. It happens all the time, all yeah. the time. Yep. And, you know, Mahomes was amazing in 2018. We don't know what would have happened if he'd never got the ankle injury or the knee injury, but you know what? Injuries happen. And it could happen to a guy that you draft in the first round at that position. That is so deep. All right. We've got Apple podcast questions and emails to read. We've got a spot in the podcast listeners league. That's uh, up for bid on eBay. Schrager, you want to tell everybody how to find it, what to do? Yeah, the link will be in the episode description, but we, as we did last year, are giving away a ton of cool things in the eBay store for St. Jude as part of the draft-a-thon. You could have a Zoom call with Jamie. Adam could announce the first round of your draft, but the coolest thing is you can be in the listener league. The starting bid's $100. We hope to raise a ton of money for St. Jude, so that link will be in the episode description, and we'll be tweeting it out. It'll be in the Facebook group, but it's an awesome way to join the listener league. Yep, the draft-a-thon is Wednesday. Uh, Wednesday, yeah, Wednesday night, uh, 6 to 8 p.m. on HQ, 8 to midnight Eastern on Twitch, twitch.com slash FF today, and we're raising a ton of money for St. Jude, and we really want you to be a part of it. 
Our draft kit is out if you want it. CBSSports.com slash kit. Get ready for your draft. Parlay Pick'em is a really fun game you can play on CBSSports.com. Go to CBSSports.com slash parlay. You can win big-time cash prizes. We're giving away over $40,000 cash with CBS Sports Parlay Pick'em. It's your chance to win, and it's completely free to play. Just correctly pick five games against the spread, answer a couple of tiebreaker questions, and you can win cash every week starting with $5,000 to the week one champ. CBSSports.com slash parlay. We're going to take a quick break. We have just a few news items, and then we've got your emails, your questions right after this. Back with your news and notes, and then we'll get to your questions. So Saquon Barkley and Sterling Shepard, they, they said they haven't ruled out sitting out games in response to the Jacob Blake shooting. We're, of course, seeing that in all the other sports around the country. And uh, I don't th- if, if this happens, I don't think it would be exclusive to one team. So I'm not no. sure, Jamie, what to, what to make of this right now. I don't think it's going to change anyone's draft strategy, but we did get some questions about it. So I thought I'd bring it up. Any, any fantasy spin on it? Well, <laughs> I mean, no, no, no. Right? I mean, like, I know, uh, no. I, I know what you're saying. Yeah. No, no uh, You know what? I'm not going to make you answer that. Uh, just look. I, I wouldn't. I wouldn't let any social situations dictate how you're drafting because you said it best. If it's going to be to one team, it's going to be to every team, and the players have a right to do what they want to do. Uh, so treat your drafts, non-injury related scenarios, as you would prior to uh, any of this thought getting into your head. Yeah, and I'm sorry for phrasing that in such a like a inelegant way. Um, my least favorite part of this is is like addressing these national issues, which has been 2020 summed up. So uh, look, uh, just support. I support uh, these actions, and I just I hope we can make things better out there. Jamie spoke to Adam Johns, who covers the Bears for the Athletic, and what did he tell you? So we touched on, you know, clearly uh, the, the, the big topics of the Bears this week in this training camp. Uh, with David Montgomery's injury, he said, you know, two to four weeks, they're still hopeful to get him back for week one, but he doesn't expect it to be a long-term injury. And when he does come back, you know, he said prior to the injury, they were looking at him as a, and this is a reporter clearly, uh, 275 carry guy. You know, he said he didn't think 300 carries, but, you know, he's looked really good in training camp. And so it's an unfortunate setback for a guy who I thought was going to have a bounce back campaign. So, um, I don't know what you guys talked about on Thursday's show um, or Friday's show, excuse me, following the injury, but I think he's still a guy that I'm going to look for round seven in PPR round eight. If it falls that way, round six to seven in non or half PPR, because it's not a long-term absence and he still should be the guy for the bears unless they make a transaction over the next couple of days, but it doesn't sound like that's going to be the case. Um, in terms of Allen Robinson, he said the bears are just being cautious with his ankle injury, but he also said that, if he's not back soon, you got to start to worry a little bit about week one. So just keep that in the back of your mind with Allen Robinson. I have dropped Robinson a couple spots just because, you know, you, you, you compare him to that group of Mike Evans, Juju, the Rams guys, you know, so he's in that mix. I put him behind Mike Evans, for example, in PPR. I had Evans uh, a couple spots behind him. Um, and then the quarterback one was the most interesting. And he said he expects, even though Foles is kind of taking a little bit of a lead right now, that he expects Trubisky to be the starter week one, which I'm sure will make Keith Cummings happy. But – he also said that they're going to have a scrimmage this weekend that could determine maybe who pulls ahead of the other guy. And the thing that he was sort of alluding to is it's easier to start Trubisky and then pull him as opposed to starting Foles and then pulling him. Because, yeah. you know, if, if you go that route, at least you're giving Trubisky the opportunity to say, we gave you one more shot and you failed again. But he brought up, you know, the relevancy of the quarterback's coach of John Filippo, who was with Nick Foles in Jacksonville. And that influence that he may have, especially, you know, Nagy also has a relationship with Foles uh, previously. Ty Johnson, remember him? He has been seeing some first-team reps for the Lions with DeAndre Swift sidelined. So it's running back Ty Johnson. I don't think we're drafting Ty Johnson, right? No, but you got to be a little bit concerned about Swift now because yep. this is a, a young player who is missing time. And if the talk is play him in passing situations, that's where he needs the work. So I'm, I'm concerned. You know, I, I think if, if you're debating, and I know we've had this conversation with Ben Gretsch, if you're debating Cam Akers, DeAndre Swift, to me it's easy at this point. I'm taking Cam Akers. What about David Montgomery or DeAndre Swift? I'm taking Swift because I, I still think that there's more upside with him. A PPR, non-PPR, I would take Montgomery. Okay. And Devin Singletary, boy, he's had some fumbling issues according to The Athletic. 
just doesn't see it's funny because it, it i'm you know we're not there we're not at practice but it just feels like there have been a lot of kind of negative reports about singletary but there's also been some hype and it's easy to forget just how good he was last year i mean per carry he was incredible um he did catch some passes i know he wasn't great in the passing game but he he had a decent amount of catches he had a ton of carries i mean he was one of the the biggest workhorses Devin singletary to end the season and then he got a lot of work in the playoff game. So I'm wondering if he's going to start falling so far where it's going to be good value. But when are you going to take Devin Singletary? I have right now in my rankings, non-PPR, because I'm just staring at it. Singletary, Montgomery, Zach Moss. That's how close they are for me right now. Okay. So right. I'm not taking Singletary at the earliest, earliest mid-round six. All righty. Well, let's regulate. Send us your questions, fantasy regulators, in the subject line to fantasyfootball at cbsi.com. This is from Neil. Keeper League debate requires your influence. Our commissioner recently decided two weeks ago to put our league on hold until next season. The issue at hand is that there were trades made and approved over the summer while our league was still operating as if we were playing in 2020. The question is, should these trades be honored when the league returns for the 2021 season, or should the commissioner rescind the trades? For what it's worth, one team gave up A.J. Brown and Kareem Hunt and got back DeAndre Hopkins and, I'm guessing, Derek, I don't know, Henry, he just said. So, Jamie, these, uh, these trades were made. The season was canceled, put on hold till 2021. Should the trades stand? Yes. Because you made the trades before the, the league was decided to be put on hold. I disagree with I'm going to say this. I'm going to be the, like, take the bridge here. Uh, Reset in the trades and let them, if they want to do it again, knowing the situation, they can do it again. Why not? Uh, I mean, Good I would talk. personally, I'd rescind the commissioner and play the league out. Yeah, what the hell? Why are people doing this? I, this is really upsetting me for obvious I have, I have a, a league that I started several years ago, and there's, I think, three teams that two people share a team. Uh, two of them are two of the teams are two brothers and another one is two friends. And one of the, the, the friends decided he didn't want to play the league this year and suggested let's put the league on hold. And I was like, there's, there's no way. I mean, it's just, if they're playing football, we're playing fantasy. If you don't want to do the league, don't do the league. I can't you know, force you to do it. Um, he's the only person that I've heard of my all brother, the leagues that I do. Brother's league is, is not playing this year. They're convinced the season's not going to finish, from what I understand. Uh, I think that it will finish. I'm more optimistic. If, now if that baseball is finishing. Well, but here's the thing about baseball. is like, first of all, baseball is finishing before flu season. And baseball is able to cancel games and make them up. That is my one question for football. You know, if baseball gets two guys on a team or two guys in an organization, for example, test positive, like the Mets last weekend. They canceled their, their entire weekend series. Uh, so... They took basically four days off, I think. I don't know what happens with football. I, I, I was curious why they didn't say, all right, let's, let's play a 12-game season and let's do it in 17 weeks and give ourselves some buffer. I think football is going to have to have lower or higher standards for canceling games because like, if two people in an organization in football have COVID, you can't just cancel the game. If you do, then we're in trouble. But the testing is getting a little bit better. There was a big development yesterday. I'm more optimistic now that they're going to finish it. But, but this is why I, I also just, think that you got to like, factor in. Start to start your fantasy season. If it gets canceled, then have rules about what happens in terms of payoff. right. You can you can you can figure that out. The other yeah. part of it is, uh, and I think this is something that this is just purely uh, you know conspiracy theory. But football has always kind of wanted to get to Presidents' Weekend and have that Monday off. I wouldn't be surprised if they're in their mind banking in, if they had to push back the playoffs a few weeks. I guess, now, I, mean, I guess they could keep extending it. Sure. Yeah. Let's extend the season. All right. You know what? Let's get to the questions here. we got a lot of them. Start with Apple podcast questions. Play your league. Play, yeah. Play your league. Uh, from uh, a small town in Northeastern Massachusetts. I'm sorry. I don't have this person's name. That's my bad. Uh, okay. It help, this keep the podcast coming. It helps me get through my crappy work days. Pick nine in a 10 team full PPR two keeper startup league. I'm hoping Clyde Edwards Elair falls to me and I can grab Jacobs with pick 12. If Clyde Edwards Elair does not fall to me at the ninth pick in a startup keeper league PPR, who do you recommend grabbing with my first pick? Uh, 
So you're hoping for Edward Solaire. Yeah, I mean, like any of the young running, Miles Sanders would be great. Josh Jacobs would be gay, great. Yeah, uh, I'm just trying to think, like, you know, this, this is something we probably don't say enough of. Nick Chubb next year without Kareem Hunt there has yeah. top five upside. Mixon, do you think, you think Mixon, or is he, like, a little too old? I, I don't think he's too old, but, like, Mixon, this whole thing with the migraines is starting to make me a little nervous. Because I don't think it's back. migraines. Yeah, I don't think it's migraines. Right. Um, but in, in, in any event, I would, I would probably, Jonathan Taylor. is Jonathan Taylor worth as, see, that's, when, when you, when you asked me that, like the first place I went to was actually JK Dobbins. Um, like that's way too soon for those guys. Cause you want to be competitive this year. But I think like Jacobs, Chubb, Sanders, all three of those guys are the, probably the trio I would look for. And if you can get two of them, especially since you're picking at the back end of round one, um, that's where I would look. This is from Nick in California. I just drafted a 10-team league. I'm not comfortable with my last two picks, Alan Lazard and Robbie Anderson. Should I drop one of them for Brady, Ryan, Wentz, even though I have Lamar Jackson? I would probably drop Robbie Anderson for one. And then, you know, should A, Jackson get hurt, or B, one of those guys has a blow-up game, try and trade them. So uh, if those quarterbacks are available, you said an 18-team league? 10 team league when Ryan Brady available. So I'd go look to see if Josh Kelly was available first. Yeah, I mean, honestly, I'm not sure Lazard needs to be owned in a 10 team league. Mm-hmm. Um, one thing we don't talk about is like, yeah, you may not need Brady, Ryan, or Wentz, but it's not a horrible idea to keep him, keep those guys away from your opponents. You know, so, so you don't have to play against them. So I, I would is, definitely drop Robbie some, Anderson. I might drop both guys. This is something that you run into with 10 team leagues. And in some cases, if you have a really good 12 team draft or salary cap scenario. So our salary cap league, I don't know if you guys talked about this. Um, my team, I took a very balanced approach. And my two worst players right now are Mike Gusecki and Jared Goff. When am I going to drop those guys if they play well? I can't. Yeah, I've had that, I've had that issue before with quarterback. It's like, right. can't, I, I, I just can't. need another position. I have to drop him. He's so good. Right. Weird. So... Like you, you run into, more so in 10 team leagues. Like you run into those scenarios in 10 team leagues. Like, who am I cutting? Oh my gosh. This case, it's not so hard. But I think if you're going to drop, like, I would, I would probably hold Lazard just in case. Sure. He does have top 30 upside because I think he does. Um, but Robbie Anderson, I think it's going to be hard for him in that offense to be consistently good. All right. Let, yeah. All right. Let's now pick it up. Here we go. From Jim in Detroit. How much does running back ranking change when rushing points are 1.5 points for 10 yards? A ton. It's a PPR league. And that's receiving too? Or just rushing? No, he just said rushing. Yeah, I mean, you want the guys that are going to be in the rushing leading category for sure. So, you know, Derrick Henry is, is a little better in that department. Uh, Nick Chubb is better in that department. It is um, such a, This is like – ridiculous but this is where you prioritize some just at the top you prioritize zeke over kamara i I mean i'm not taking a wide receiver i'm I'm taking any running back okay any running back that could get a thousand yards that's like 1500 yards in a you know in normal scoring so so but but it could be the same for the receivers he he just asked about that he said rushing points are 1.5 yards it's a ppr league right but okay so in this case right austin eckler gets downgraded even though it's ppr Behind who, though? Chubb, for example. Like, in yeah. PPR, he goes ahead of Chubb. Right, yeah, yeah. But, like, Nick Chubb, to me, Nick Chubb ahead of Michael Thomas. Oh, again, unless the receivers get one and a half per unless receiving year. I, I think to, the way I interpret this as what, what changes for the backs. Yeah. Uh, okay, from Wake Up 23, how do you determine draft order? The one I always choose is draft order will automatically randomize one hour before your draft starts feel like it's fair across the league so you don't want to give people a chance to prepare yeah i don't i don't know i like the randomizing but i don't know that you need the to do it before. one hour before give people a right. chance to trade chance to prepare yeah um yeah i think they should i always like to do it a few days out yeah this is from mad aussie 27 12 team league two keepers aj brown is one keeper who should my second be uh boston scott as one of my last picks or adam Thielen with my fourth pick fourth round pick I'd probably take Thielen just to get that second receiver. From Jay Pave, PPR, keep Juju or Mike Evans? Know your limit or penalty for rounds? 
Juju. Juju, okay. And from 42 God. This is so there... fascinating because what we don't know what's happening next year. Yeah. And they both could have different quarterbacks next year. Are there any wide receivers with good fantasy mat- matchups? And does this matter? Yeah, um, it, it matters. But, you know, I mean, again, I'll go back to it. We, we saw two teams in the AFC North already lose key members of their secondary, in Earl Thomas and Grant Delpit. You know, so corners are going to get hurt. I, I wouldn't base my drafting solely on what the, the good matchups are versus what the bad matchups are. I'm familiar with wide receivers who have bad matchups. I'm thinking, okay, like, I think the AFC South is going to have some pretty bad pass defenses. So T.Y. Hilton is interesting. I mean, at Jacksonville, Minnesota, we know their cornerback situation could be pretty ugly. The Jets, yuck. The Bears might not be easy. The Browns, they just lost Greedy Williams. The Bengals. And Delpit. The Lions. Like, the whole schedule for every Colts seems to be really favorable. Sorry, I don't have more answers for you. Time for emails. Uh, I'm going to shorten. This is a really good email here from Matt in the Bay. I'm going to shorten it and just say this. He wants to know why we're, people are kind of fading the 49ers other than George Kittle. Not a lot of love for Mostert. Debo's kind of a late-round pick. Nobody seems to give a thought to Jimmy Garoppolo. But they were one of the best offenses last year with Garoppolo coming off an ACL. Um, his first year playing full-time under Kyle Shanahan. Now they got McKinnon back. He's been, they, they may have upgraded at left tackle uh, with Trent Williams. Maybe. So, yeah, I mean, uh, what's your thought on this? Like, do you think that the Niners' offense is not respected enough in fantasy? Well, I mean, you have the passing game, for example, which ties in Garoppolo. Their best receiver is hurt. Like, we're, how, how much love are we supposed to give Debo Samuel? If he's 100%, he's a top 30 wide receiver. No question. Yeah, let's so we've said Garoppolo, that though, because we never mentioned him as like a late round pick. Well, again, you know, we can't sit here and say, huh? This has to throw more. It, but it's not just that. Why are we downgrading Aaron Rodgers? His supporting cast has been stripped away. Yeah. If you take away Debo Samuel for a significant stretch, we don't know what Ayuk is going to do who's battling a hamstring injury. Right, but right you now, can't just rely on George Kittle. Right now, it seems like Debo's not going to miss a lot of time. We don't know that, though. He may not miss a game. I mean, they seem pretty obvious. He may not miss a game. And he may have a setback and miss several games. That's the nature of that injury. Yeah, but you, okay, you sure. But let's say Debo's back in week two or three. You know, Garoppolo, the, the, the reason why you would like Garoppolo is that even Nick, Nick Mullins, Jimmy Garoppolo, every quarterback in this San Francisco offense under Shanahan, beginning with Garoppolo three seasons ago, and then Mullins, yep. they have been among the best in yards per attempt. They, yeah, it's a great they, offense. Yes, they're a great offense. So if they throw more... Like, he doesn't, he's a statue. He doesn't run. That sucks. But he could be, yeah, sure. Throw Garoppolo in there. He could be a top 12 guy, like back end. He was 13 last year. That's so, true. you know, in, in terms of season production, he was the 13th quarterback. He throws touchdowns. I mean, that's the, the, the nice thing about it. But to me, Garoppolo and Kirk Cousins are the same type of guy. Mm-hmm. They're not going to hurt you, but I don't think they're going to win you your league unless something dramatically changes. And, and to say, I know you're, you're reading the reports, but what are the 49ers continuing to do? Now, it could be Jalen Hurd's injury. Brandon oh. Ayuk is banged up. They're just bringing in receivers left and right. I mean, it's, it's, it's pretty obvious that there's, this is a position of, of need for them. Yeah. Um, also, Garoppolo, it just doesn't seem like he has, like, top five upside. And Mostert is in a timeshare. Okay, moving on. Jim in Michigan. Why does Philip Lindsay get more love than Jordan Howard? And the question is not about Jordan Howard now. It's about Jordan Howard in the past. I looked at the first few years' stats for Jordan Howard, Alfred Morris, and Philip Lindsay. With Melvin Gordon in town, it wouldn't surprise me to see Lindsay get the same treatment that Alfred Morris and Jordan Howard got. Lindsay is in the dead zone, and I, for one, say stay away. You can. Uh, I, I think they're both in timeshares. And I think that Howard, his lack of a role in the passing game, and uh, I haven't seen this from the Dolphins, but we know it's happened in the past in Chicago and Philadelphia where they said, oh, he's going to be involved as a pass catcher, and he's never really involved as a pass catcher. Now, Matt Burrito's career high is 27 catches, so it doesn't scream off the page that he's going to come in and be this big-time pass-catching running back. But I would anticipate, based on their skill set, that Burrito's a better pass catcher and use more in that role than Jordan Howard is. So, Lindsey, if you look last year, uh, four of his – I think it was four of his first seven or five of his first eight games, he had at least four catches. 
So while he does not do a lot with it and his pass protection may not be good, he's been getting good reviews on that this year. And maybe he takes a little bit of that away from Melvin Gordon. So they're, they're very similar ranked for me. Um, I, would, I would look at it this way. In non-PPR, Howard's probably got an edge because he's probably going to lead the Dolphins in rushing touchdowns. In PPR, I think Lindsey has an edge. All right. Next email is from Mike. Do you, due to their tremendous upside, would you have any qualms about taking Clyde edwards elair and Jonathan Taylor as your two starting running backs in a half PPR league? It's just you're, you're adding risk um, to the scenario. But I don't know if there I, – I guess I shouldn't say that because I don't know how much risk there is with edwards elair barring injury. He's going to get the chance to be the guy. Yeah, the question it, is, edwards elair is your first-round pick. Where is – when is uh, your – Fourth round. Fourth round. Fourth round. Then no, absolutely not. You probably want to take some more running backs because you may not want to start Taylor right away. But boy, you could win your league with those two guys. Mm-hmm. Um, from Paul, I'm a commissioner in a dynasty league. One of my league mates brought up a question and was hoping you guys can help. Sunday games are played as normal. Matchups are decided, but there's a matchup or two that have players on the Monday night game to be decided. But what happens if the Monday night game gets canceled on Monday because of COVID? What should the protocol be if that happens? Typically, I think what we have seen with some uh, natural disaster scenarios, hurricanes and whatnot, that our scoring goes through Tuesday. I don't know what we would do if there's a game pushback to Tuesday, for example. Let's just say the NFL said we're going to play the game on Tuesday because whatever. Um, My guess is that our system would adjust or you adjust it manually. But if the game happens in that scoring period, that's when it should count. So if they push it to Wednesday, they push it to Thursday, and then the schedule gets altered, but it's still the week two schedule per se, I would count it the week two scoring. As far as the way baseball has been going, um, if a game just gets canceled, like let's say the game gets canceled and then they, the the NFL scheduled uh, some games so that teams have like common bye weeks early in the season. You You play teams that have a common bye week early in the year. So like, let's say a uh, game gets canceled and then they, these teams can make it up on a bye week and they lose their bye week. Yeah. Um, the way it works with fantasy baseball right now is like, you just get screwed. I mean, right. That's the scoring period. It becomes, that's so it the becomes. scoring period. And you know, if you had the Mets last weekend and they didn't play their weekend games, it got canceled. You just didn't get the points and that was it. So it's a decision we'll have to make. And I, d- I don't have a concrete answer, but I would think that if the game gets made up later in the year, you lose, you know, you lose, you just don't get the points. You're basically just kind of crap out of luck from a uh, feast in Montclair, New Jersey. Dear Harry Lloyd and Seabass. Ben Trager, you know that Harry Lloyd and Seabass? Nope. Dumb and dumber. I mean, you didn't like dumb and dumber, right? It was okay. I didn't think it was that funny. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I've been listening to you, you watch guys. Dumb and Dumber, not Dumb and Dumber, right? Is there a difference? Yes. <laughs> yes there was a very, very bad sequel. Well, yeah, I, that, that was might have been it. <laughs> no. You watched the, the original one, right? It was the original. Okay. okay. But what was the second one when they were younger? Was that considered the sequel? <sighs> I don't know. Was it or was pre- the sequel the one that they did like a couple years ago, which I haven't seen? Look, man. I'm not watching any of them other than Dumb and Dumb. Like, I'm not watching any of the other ones. The originals is the only one. And it's great to have Schrager on here because his takes are worse than mine. Not true. So uh, I have a chance to keep LaVisca Chenault for up to five years in my keeper league. I'm keeping Kittle, McLaurin, and either Chenault, Gallup, or Debo. So would you take Chenault, Gallup, or Debo? And it feels like he he can keep Chenault for longer than the others. Why does he have to make that decision now? That's a draft pick? Yeah. You have, to, you have to announce your keepers before the season? I guess so, yeah. That's weird. Um, I mean, McLaurin is an easy one. No, he's keeping Kittle and McLaurin. So it's one out of Chenault, Gallup, and Debo. I mean, Gallup could be the number one somewhere else for all we know. Uh, I'm, Who would you keep? I think it's a tough decision. I, would, I mean, if I have to make the decision now, I'm keeping Gallup. Okay. This is from Chris. I'm in a 10-team PPR Superflex League with no spot for a tight end. You can, they have a wide receiver slash tight end spot. So with that said, where do tight ends go? When, when should they be drafted if you don't have to start one? Kelsey and Kittle would be – Kelsey would be mid-round two. 
Kittle would be late round two, early round three. Um, I kind of view them like where I draft wide receivers, where I have them ranked right now. Well, but like we're taking Kelsey over Hopkins, right, in a normal league. Yes. Would you do that in this league where you don't have to start a tight end? Yeah, I think he's going to put up similar type numbers. Do you, really? Yeah. Okay. Um, from Joe, salary cap draft questions. Uh, I didn't have time for all of them, Joe. I'm sorry. But how do you adjust your dollar values for $200 budgets? It can't be as simple as just doubling them because there will, be, there will still be dollar bids um, in $200 budget leagues. So it's actually you double, a, the, you double the top guys. You double. You might be able to spend a little bit more on the elite guys, right? Than just doubling their values. So you will save money with those dollar bids in a two hundred dollar league because the same guys who are going for a dollar in a one hundred dollar league are going for a dollar in a two hundred dollar league. You have a few extra bucks to spend, maybe. Yes, but I think you know you still look at the top guys like McCaffrey is around thirty five typically in a hundred dollar budget. You know, All right, let's you know, get one more. Maybe, maybe it goes for 75 in a $200 budget. One more question from Russ. Um, basically wants to know who the best top 10 offenses and targeting like number two and number three receivers on those teams. The Jets, Washington football team, Chicago. Um, yeah, the Chiefs are interesting because Kelsey's obviously their, their number two receiver. But the Chiefs are the best. The Chiefs, what, Cowboys, Ravens, who don't throw a lot. I mean, the 49ers have a great offense, but they just don't have a lot of great fantasy options. The Cowboys are amazing. Mm -hmm. uh, the Saints are amazing. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm going to put, put the Steelers back up there. The Falcons, yes. Uh, I think – see, this is where it gets fun because I think we're going to see some good offensive performances from Jacksonville and Carolina, but those aren't great skill position players in Jacksonville, for example. I don't know that they're going to be top 10 offenses. I mean, Carolina No, but I think, I think they're going to throw a lot. Both those two teams. Who else? Who else? The the Browns. They have the potential to be. Chargers. I don't know now with Mike Williams' injury. Giants, Eagles. Eagles for sure. Although the Dillard injury is not good. Lions. Yeah, I think so. But again, you know, we're we're talking passing games in this case. These those yeah. some of those teams don't run the ball very well. Bucks. Yeah. Bucks should. Cardinals, Rams, they have a chance. Every, every team in the NFC West has a chance to be top 10. We probably just listed half the league as top 10 offenses. All right. Thanks for your emails, everybody, your Apple Podcast questions. If you're drafting this week, best of luck to you. We got another episode either Sunday night or Monday. Probably, you'll hear it Monday morning whenever we record it. So It'll be Sunday night. It'll be Sunday. Right, Sunday night. Sunday night. Have a great weekend. And uh, remember the Draftathon is Wednesday, 6 to midnight uh, Eastern on HQ for two hours, on Twitch for four hours. See you later, everybody. Thanks, Jamie. Thanks, Ben. Thank you all for listening. I'm going to stop talking now. Bye. Want more of the Fantasy Football Today podcast and nonstop year-round fantasy advice? It's simple. Hit the subscribe button and hang with us all throughout the year.